My name is David Moravi. Some people know me as DJ Delight. I am father of three, but I can't call them kids anymore because two of them are adults. So two boys and one younger girl. Born in Nairobi, creative at heart, an auditor by profession. My late father was actually a rags to riches story. When he was young, he used to regale us with stories about, you know, how many kilometers they used to run with torn shorts and no shoes to school in Nanyuki. He was a salesman and he was a businessman par excellence. All my siblings, there's a way we are that definitely reflects a lot on my father, as well as my mother, who was a teacher. And it's interesting, my mother nurtured my creative side my father nurtured my business side, so to speak. So it's that combination that makes me complete. For example, growing up from the age of six, we always spent part of our holiday time working within one of his businesses. And I learned just to, to put customer first, so to speak. And I actually think I learned all those things in my really young age. By the time I was 13, I was at KPCU, you know, learning how to sell coffee. That progressed into a property business. When I think about it, I actually had quite a lot of experience in different departments and doing different things. And that's how he raised us. And that's how you got your pocket money. You had to work for it. There was no, oh, here, I want a hundred bob. Oh, okay, here. Nothing like that. You had to work for it. So he did build that work ethic in, in myself and my siblings, to be honest. So two things happened to me whilst at university. Actually, university at Manchester was, I think, my biggest transformation in my entire life. It's what molded who I am today. Why? I was studying accounting and finance, a degree in accounting and finance, which molded me to get into an audit career thereafter with Ernst & Young. However, at the same time, whilst at university, in order to make some spare cash, actually first I started as a waiter, then I realized that's not for me. And then by accident, I started DJing, then I really learned how to do it, and I started organizing events. I also started managing some bands, some student bands. And without knowing, my creative career was actually born. And actually it was nurtured during my university time. By the time I was in my second year, I was actually one of the top house music DJs in the United Kingdom. Did a lot of tours, opened for a lot of big acts like Run DMC, Simply Red, The Sugar Hill Gang, Brand New Heavies, I mean big, big groups at the time. Did a lot of band management, so two of my band bands that I managed um, got signed up to Warner Brothers by the time I was in my third year. When I look back on it now, you know, who knew what was happening? And then. We used to hold a lot of events. We used to call them raves at the time. So were partly illegal and then they got legalized. These were just big house techno events out in the middle of nowhere. You convert a barn and just have a wild party and charge people. And, you know, there were groups who used to organize it. And I was one of the DJs and sometimes I got involved in the organization. So that's where I learned how to do events, event management. I was also a dance choreographer. It's an interesting part. So basically I was doing anything and everything creative. <laughs> to make a little spare cash, and I made quite a lot of spare cash. But more importantly, I nurtured, I think, the creativity in me. And afterwards, so I joined Ernst & Young in London and trained to become a chartered accountant. So I continued working for Ernst & Young for a number of years in London. Then I decided, I think after 13 years in the UK, it's time to come home. So I packed my bags, came back home, and continued working for Ernst & Young, but at the East African office, specializing in banking and manufacturing, which are two things I'm still very passionate about. I also made a decision to rekindle my entertainment business, for lack of a better word, but this time in an East African environment. And at the time, I teamed up with a well-known producer, Ted Josiah, and I have to say he had a lot to do with just igniting that sort of creative business side. And Together, you know, we, we made a quite a formidable team and, and we set up a business that basically um, identified talent. He recorded the talent, I managed the talent. I remember one of the first artists I started managing back in 97 was an artist called Hardstone, who had a famous song called Ohiki. And he was the first artist I managed in Kenya. So Ted was recording, uh, you know, he's the one who recorded uh, Hardstone and I managed him and together we basically nurtured, you know, his career as well as following that. The next one was Kalamashaka, you know, known as really the, the godfathers of hip-hop in Africa, not just in Kenya. Followed by that was I met a young rapper known as Nazizi, who had known much earlier when she was really tiny because I knew her parents said, oh, you know, I can rap. 
na famous song mama mama nataka kuwa rapper you know famous ka kala mashaka you know it's interesting and then soon after that i met uh, yre again through you know ted also looking for talent so i managed all these artists amongst quite a number shila moniga temi was part of a group called in two with a young lady called natasha then katapaki and so all the artists I nurtured, I helped nurture their careers and, and you know, we recorded them. And we had a famous um, album we took out called Kenyan First Chapter and another one called Kenyan Second Chapter later. And in second chapter, we had Gidi Gidi Maji Maji, who I also started managing. And the famous songs we recorded amongst others was Ting Badi Malo and Unbogable. Then after that, Waire and, and, and Nazizi teamed up with Bamzigi and we formed Necessary Noise and you know they're famous for a lot of their songs, Kenyan Girl, Kenyan Boy, etc. Another memorable artist who I met and brought her down to Nairobi was Susanna Wio and recorded the, the famous Kisumu 100, which became, like many other songs we recorded, national, you know, literally national songs, so to speak. I mean, it's still played up to today and a lot of those songs are still played up to today. Ted and I are actually the people who discovered Nameless. So Mega Rider was recorded by us. And what had happened, there was a show on Capitol, and we decided just to go up to Capitol and start a, a very random star search type thing on air. I think it was more than Ibuika who was running the show, Hits Not Homework. DJ John Rabah was DJing, and those days we used to use turntable, um, you know, um, vinyl and turntable. It wasn't digital, maneno. And he'd play an instrumental and people would call in and rap or sing over it. And on the second week, so you competed in the week, whoever won, came to our studio on Saturday and released their song on Monday. The second week, it was Nameless, the winner, and released the song on Monday, I'll never forget. By Wednesday, it was one of the most played songs on Kenyan radio stations. Then were very few, to be, to be fair, uh, but literally it was played. I mean, everyone was demanding the song and it was, you know, it became a hit and that's how Nameless was born, so to speak. Um, so we have a lot of happy memories. I have a lot of happy memories of the studio, but one for me, or the most memorable um, events that we organized amongst others, or well, two actually, was uh, the BAT Benson and Hedges Golden Tones um, event, which took us close to eight months to organize. I think at the time, really the biggest event we'd ever organized. It was a massive event. And um, it was held at the carnival and we had nearly 15,000 um, people. Um, and it was a 24-hour performance. We had. 21 groups performing from East Africa, from Nigeria. It was quite, organizing that was quite, it brought out every event management bone in my body. And soon after that, Safaricom launched. We were very luckily subcontracted by Gina Dean, um, Corporate Communications to, to manage. I think that really set us on a really good course um, in event management in Kenya. Around 2002, my father passed away very suddenly. In, in the course of, of, of sort of managing the affairs of my, my late father, helping the family just, you know, put stuff together. And that was the beginning of the consultancy I, I, I basically run up to now, which is Creative Enterprise Center, which is a training consultancy, um, a training and mentoring consultancy. And what we basically do is travel around Africa, uh, mainly Kenya, but, you know, we've had the chance to really travel around quite a number of countries in Africa, running business skills workshops for creative entrepreneurs, especially young creative entrepreneurs. So what do I mean by creative entrepreneurs? People literally running everything from film business to music business to uh, fine art to fashion to photography to design to app development, you know, literally across the whole creative um, specter. But alongside, I never stopped DJing. That's one thing. Uh, from my early days in university, you know, and 31 years later now, I'm still the DJ and what DJing does for me more than anything else, it's, it's, it's a fun hobby, but I always tell people it's my therapy. For me, music is my release. Playing music, not just at home, but playing it for people, that's my form of therapy. And over the years, it's, it's even in my worst, darkest moments, it's kept me very calm. I literally put headphones on, my whole spirit just calms down. For me, music, I mean, if you want to really punish me, take music away from me. That's like the ultimate punishment, like literally. Or take my hearing away. That, that would finish me off, certainly. I remember in Standard 5, we had a public speaking competition and I excelled, for lack of a better word, at Muthaiga Primary School. And I think my public speaking sort of life was nurtured through that. 
And it's interesting because today I am a master of ceremony, a corporate MC, etc. And it's a natural progression of my public speaking youth, uh, you know, um, involvement. My life successes have been a combination of a number of things, I believe. Being in the right place at the right time, sometimes the right people, sometimes the right motivation, sometimes the right pitch. For example, I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to be the chosen music curator and DJ for President Barack Obama's visit to Kogelo. I mean, there's no greater privilege a DJ can ever ask for or a music curator can ever ask for. And I say music curation, why? Because it wasn't just for the event at Kogelo, there were some private dinners, etc., etc., and lunches, I mean, and, you know, I had to, like, you know, put some music together in a very cleverly crafted way. I've actually never worked so hard to do that ever in my life. It was, I was quite anxious. Apparently the feedback was that he really did like the music. And how did that happen, however? So that happened because I had nurtured a good business and personal friendship with Jinadine Karaoke of Jinadine Group, who, as I said earlier, also subcontracted work to me much earlier in my career launching Safaricom, etc. Sometimes I think a combination of luck, sometimes a combination of, you know, all the effort you've put into building your brand. Sometimes it's really work you've really worked hard to look, look for. So it's, it's hard to pin it down. But I believe I am a go-getter. I am not lazy by any chance. I've worked really hard to build a really good reputation. And one thing I am known for, and I know that um, with confidence, I can say is um, I have integrity in the industry, I have integrity. Ask any artist, ask any supplier I've ever worked with in the past. I mean, I had certain principles. For example, when the job is done, you get paid immediately. Whether or not the client had paid me or not, I always try to get money in advance to make sure at least my suppliers are paid immediately. Um, and that's one principle I still stand up to up to today. And also time integrity. I know it sounds like a very simple thing, but in the industry I was in, especially then, you know, event management and managing of artists, Time integrity was one of the most profound things to really develop, both not just in myself, but even in my artists. So if I, you know, if we had a booking for a show and it was for three and they needed to be there by 12, I had to make sure they understood and nurtured that ability for them to just naturally be good timekeepers. And I think I did that with a lot of success to a lot of the artists I managed. One thing about building a brand is consistency. You have to be consistent in your value system as a creative, for example. I feel one of my value systems, and we used to define them, is integrity. Integrity comes about not just in paying your suppliers on time and, you know, but it's also about how you handle your client, how you handle the event, and how you deliver and even exceed expectation on what you promise to deliver. I think one of the most crucial things is your network, and particularly in our Kenyan business society. The art of networking is how you know somebody. So you can, you can be somebody who knows 20,000 people, but how do you know them and how do they know you? Bless you, man. This, guy, yeah, really, man. this guy has been such an inspirational figure for us. I'm a Jushikam corner for many years. bro. And I think that's where effective networking comes in. You've got to nurture networks. It's not enough just to know people and have their number on your phone. You have to nurture networks, which means spending time, you know, meeting with people, engaging them even when there's not a business opportunity sitting. It's just finding out, hey, how are you? It's been a while, we've spoken. Are you well? How's your family? How's business going? Boom, small conversation and not small talk, but real intentional talk because that's how you build long lasting uh, networks. My experiences, I think it's been a combination of the two that have led to a lot of opportunities coming my way. I am 50, so this has, this has taken time to build. It's not something that came overnight. It's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice, sometimes, you know, blood and tears. But I think finally certain things are paying off. And sometimes it does take that long. And, and I particularly want to especially encourage people in, who are starting off in business, who have started off in business recently, who might feel, you know, maybe the economy is not supporting me and, you know, things are a bit rough. You know what? One of the key elements of being an entrepreneur is having the stomach for survival. Some people lose money and totally collapse and just never recover because it's the end all. But when you realize it's just, it's just another experience. It literally is just another experience. And in this experience, you lost money. And back to, again, you might call me a super positivist, but it's like, so why did I lose money? What could I have done better? Okay. So it might take some time to pay that back, but let's get into a plan. 
I get into an action plan basically when something like that happens. Like, okay, how do we resolve this? Let's not just stare like a, you know, a deer in the headlights and get hit and just collapse. So, okay, this has happened. You can't do anything about that. What you can do about is how you react to the situation. Some of the opportunities that I think my journey as an entrepreneur and as a mentor, as a business mentor, because I do consider myself a business mentor, especially for the creative sector, not limited to, but definitely heavily geared towards the creative sector. I've been afforded a lot of opportunities um, to sit on some influential uh, boards, such as the Kenya Copyright Board, because of my work in the creative sector. So I sat in as representing the creative industry, actually, as a member representing the creative industry for six years, which helped me contribute a lot more to the sector through IP uh, protection and, and spreading you know, the, the whole ethos of, of IP protection, which is at the core of any business, not just creatives. So that was quite profound. As well as I've had the privilege, and I call it a privilege, of sitting on a board in London called the Rumi Foundation, which is an organization that does a lot of social investments, for lack of a better word. Um, we basically support people doing good things in the world. It's just a good summary of putting it. And my good friend, Lord Rumi, um, Virgie, uh, who invited me to sit on his board, you know, which I was, he's an old family friend, but I was very privileged because there's so many other people he could have selected in his wide network, international network. But I think having known me for quite a while, as he has, um, I believe he did see the integrity and my focus in life um, and thought there's something I could you know, bring to the table. And I've sat in it for over 12 years. One of the highlights, actually, of opportunities is actually, uh, it's one of my most fun events in the year, is actually being the DJ for the Safaricom Jazz, International Jazz uh, Festival for the last six years. And that came about from you know, a series of interactions we've had with Safaricom Limited over the years since the launch. I've done a lot of nurturing of creatives, their music assets, uh, Nikon and Safaricom Live, um, and a host of others. Um, and I've had the opportunity to nurture a lot of um, and mentor a lot of artists through that, Saudi Soul, Octopizo, Gloria Muliro, to name a few. And because of that constant contact and them seeing also my body of work, and my love of jazz, I was really excited when they first asked me to uh, come on as the DJ, and I've, I have been since. Um, and I tell you where the privilege lies there, and I use the word privilege very carefully, not in a silver spoon sort of way. Um, it's been such a privilege to be able to meet Grammy Award winners who I only used to dream about and play their music when I was younger, and suddenly I'm on the same stage as them and we're talking one-on-one. -on -one. For me, that's one of my best creative experiences, I must admit, that I've had, is the Safaricom Jazz, you know, International Jazz Festival. Um, but it's interesting because now what I'm thinking about is how can I nurture the next jazz DJ? Because I won't be DJing forever, you know, on, I'm 50 now. You know, it's time to, kazi kwa vijana, so to speak. So actually that's the next phase I'm actually looking at is maybe the next time I DJ I'll have a co-DJ who maybe for a couple of years I'll nurture and then let it go and let that co-DJ um, take over. I have creative children. They're all in a creative field one way or another, in university, in school. And I always tell people that's a very strong motivator to ensure that the environment for creative entrepreneurs is a lot better than when I found it. It's just as plain and simple as that. And be it in IP, be it in collections of monies from CMOs, be it in uh, government policies on youth empowerment and women empowerment, be it uh, you know improving training for creatives um, in their business skills and creating such opportunities as well, be it mentorship of young creative entrepreneurs, anything I can do within my power, because I can't do everything, but whatever I can do within my power to improve that arena and leave that legacy of, I can be a creative entrepreneur with no fear. That ultimately is my legacy. My message to, especially the young entrepreneurs today, and not necessarily the creative entrepreneur, just the entrepreneur today. The world is really changing and very soon white collar jobs will become um, a lot less because of automation. And very soon I think everyone will be termed an entrepreneur.
Because very soon, big companies will have five employees, where beforehand they had 50. Do you know what I mean? So the nature of employment has, has it's sort of evolving. And even within large companies today, they're actually encouraging an entrepreneurial spirit in their members of staff. So you stop looking like, you know, at yourself like an employee, start looking at yourself as an entrepreneur within a company. And it changes the innovation and creativity within the company and how you contribute to their growth. Um, so I'd encourage any person thinking of venturing or who've already ventured into entrepreneurship to one, be consistent in what you do, in your value systems. Don't say one thing and do the opposite. That's one. But two is have a really strong stomach for this because it's quite a ride. It's got ups and downs. And I can assure you at the end of it all, it's really satisfying because it gives you control over your future and you can dictate it. And it's up to you to really decide whether you're going to succeed or not. But last but not least, pay it forward. Most important thing. When you succeed, you know, umefika, whatever that means, because you never really reach. And that's the, <laughs> that's the secret they never really tell you. You never ever succeed fully. And if you think you have, then you haven't. Is always try and nurture and let other people learn from even your mistakes and your successes. Pass it on because it's really needed. That mentorship is really needed in society.